Good morning. Good morning. Good to be in the Lord's house. Glad to be back. Uh, back in the States for sure. And um, so, uh, it's glad to be in the Lord's house today. Fourth of July is coming up. So, just before we start, let's watch this. We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty, remembering He set us free from the bondage of sin. So we might stand for justice, for the Lord loves justice, and He will not forsake His saints. So we might stand for freedom, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you, God, for the beautiful gift of our country. May we always depend on you to sustain us. All right. Yeah. So I know the office will be closed on the 4th, and so we can celebrate with our families. And so I hope everyone takes some time to celebrate the 4th and remember all the things um, that our country, country stands for. Just want to attention to a few announcements inside your bulletin. First one is the men's breakfast we have postponed for one week. Glenn's on vacation. Mingo is supposed to cook. And so we're going to put it on the 15th. So it's not this Saturday, but the following. And I think it may be off on maybe the calendar or something, but just some men may know that it's not going to be this coming Saturday, which would the 8th, but it's going to be on the 15th. Okay? And that's the way it's in your bulletin. Uh, and then again, the office is going to be closed this Tuesday. Don't forget, we have classes tonight for all ages. Come and be a part of that. Um, any other announcements? I need to make note up here this morning. No Wednesday morning? No, I, it's not any bulletin. There's no Wednesday prayer meeting this Wednesday. We'll kick back in the following Wednesday after the, after the holiday. Okay? Any others? And of course, we start the movies next Tuesday as well. I'm going to double check on the time, but I think the movie starts later than what we have in the bulletin. The bulletin says that we leave at 1040. I think we do leave at 1045. The calendar says 915. So just make note of that. We go, we'll leave the church going at 1045 uh, for the movie start next Tuesday morning. Okay? So make note that the movies are $2 and then bring money for snacks. Any others? All right. How about anyone staying? Oh, no. Anniversaries. Any anniversaries? This week? Yes. Thursday. Thursday. Wow. How long? 27 years. 27 years. Yeah. That's great. Any other anniversaries? How about birthdays? I think there's a birthday there too, right? When's your birthday? Today. Today. Uh, can I ask how long? 43. 43. All right. Any other birthdays this week? Heard there was one last week I missed. Your birthday's this week, huh? Oh, it was last week. Did y'all do happy birthday last week? Yes. And then, uh, someone over here, did someone else have a birthday? Miss Marie. Miss Marie, right. Uh, so, that's great. So let's sing happy birthday on all those. <coughs> chapter 5, verse 17. I want us to read that together, and then we're going to begin our first song this morning by singing the new creation. Uh, read with me. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Yeah. 
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day you've given us. Father, we're so thankful that we are a new creation and um, we are different people because of you. And Father, we just want to praise you and give you the honor that you deserve as we worship you here this day. So as we um, bring our worship, we pray that it would be acceptable to you and that it would uh, bring worth to your most precious and holy name. We pray all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He's out of seat. We're going to continue our worship service this morning by uh, singing that glad reunion day. Sing with me.
prayer request by me? Yes, Kathy. I'd like to thank everybody who prayed for Lindalyn. Her surgery started on time, finished on time, and went great. And she should not have any more problems. And also, thank God that I got there and back. Yeah. <laughs> and I really thank God for it. All right. It's a praise as well. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. I did. Yeah. We had a great wedding and made it back there, made it there and back safe <laughs> for everyone for their prayers. Yeah. Yes, Mom? Mike Higgins had some surgery. Yeah, Mike Higgins. It's Tina's husband. And I uh, pray for Cameron and Linda all leaving for after church to go to Colorado and Betty is going to Dallas. Yeah. And praise God. Praise it. Because we've got a job and Vegas got to have a new job, so just God yeah. is just working, and they're going to a church that I hope they can find a church all right. to, to serve God. So. Okay. Remember all those? Okay. Any others? Jackie. Jackie, yes. I'm Sarge's wife, right? Uh, not doing well, so pray for her. Okay. So, and during the Sunday school, we... Uh, Continue to remember Tammy in our prayers and her vertigo. Um, also, Leslie Sonier, she's not doing well. And then also, um, Tammy's mom, Joella, remember her as well. Any others? You may remember John in our prayers as well as he's recovering. Any others? Our mission spotlight for this week is Palladio Biblica. So, continue to pray for them all week and uh, remember them in your prayer time as well. Okay? Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you you are a magnificent and great and loving God. And uh, God, we, like we learned in Sense this morning, you are God of mercy. And it's not because of the things we do, but because of your mercy towards us and your grace towards us. And we're so thankful for that. And we just want to praise you here today and praise you for Jesus and the sacrifice he laid down for us. And we're so thankful for that. Father, we're so thankful also that we, as a congregation, can now join together here today and we can pray. And Father, we're so thankful the way you answered prayers. We thank you for Lillian and her, the answer prayers there. And for Kathy to be able to make that trip there um, back there and back safely. Um, we're just so uh, thankful for that. We're thankful for all the answered prayers and the prayers that we had to go in um, for, um, for COVID to find a job and, and um, for our safety and our traveling. And Father, we're just so thankful for all those answered prayers. And so we praise you um, for that here today. I also want to bring to you um, people that are, uh, that are um, not doing well. And um, and so I should be with Jackie and I should be with Mike Higgins. Uh, I should be with Leslie Sonia and with Tammy and her mom. Um, that um, Just lay your healing hands upon all of those. Uh, Father, actually those who are traveling. Um, Betty and Glenn are traveling. Uh, uh, coming back here. Uh, coming, uh, continuing their vacation and, and spending some time together. And uh, Father, I should be with the paper. Um, Group as they go to Denver from this mission trip, that you would give them safety and protection, and probably that these young people will, will um, learn a lot um, by serving others. And so we just um, ask you to be with them as well. But I know this is a busy time of year when a lot of people are traveling and going places and doing things. And um, Father, we just um, ask you to just continue to place your hands upon all of them as they travel and keep them safe. As you can do, those are on our continual on prayer list, and um, I ask you to be with them. Um, Tammy and as you be with John and, and um, that I usually lay your healing hands upon them as well. And uh, Father, we're so thankful, uh, even for the ones that maybe I have mentioned here today you know, that, that have been answered prayers, but Father, maybe some I haven't mentioned that are on our hearts here today. I pray for each and every one of those requests as well. Father, thank you so much for the missions we're able to support, and especially today for Collegio Bibico. And we ask you to place your hand upon her, that she will continue to serve you, and that you would. Um, continue to uh, produce workers for the kingdom and um, that we may evangelize this world in which we live in. Father, as we continue to worship you here today, we pray that all the things we say and all things we do we bring honor to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our communion here this morning, we're going to sing above all. Um, again, um, communion emblems are in the back of the auditorium on a tray. If you haven't picked up yours yet, you can pick that up as we sing. Um, we're going to have we're going to sing a song. We're going to have a devotion. Um, there'll be a short prayer, 
um, after that, and then we'll have some meditation time, and then we'll take all the emblems together. So um, let's sing together above all as we prepare for communion. to us as we consider and contemplate the meaning of communion. 
First, it reminds us that true satisfaction and contentment in life shouldn't come from our own accomplishments and successes, but rather from a deeply held hope in the future. As Christ's followers, we know hope comes from believing that someone we love and trust is still alive and at work. Second, it reminds us that no matter how honorably our intentions to place our hope and <clears throat> trust in anyone other than Jesus Christ is folly. In communion, we are invited to remember <clears throat> that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ provides us with the eternal hope for the future. As the apostle wrote, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 2.17 And so we have this same eternal hope that our work, service, and suffering for Him are not in vain because we trust in Him for today and tomorrow. Let us pray. Father, we, uh, we thank You so much for this time and this opportunity to come before Your table and to partake of these things. <coughs> this loaf which represents uh, the body of Christ and this cup which represents the blood that was uh, shed for our sins. Father, we uh, thank you so much for this love. Thank you so much for this sacrifice. We thank you for Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. <coughs> Amen. Dialogues together through the day. Um, first, let's take the bread, which now this represents Jesus' body. Let's take that again. Let's now take the cup, which represents Jesus' body. Again, this morning, for our, we also gather each source day to, to bring back um, our tithes and offerings. And, and we bring that back because we bring back a portion of the way that God has blessed each of us. And um, we bring that back to God today as our act of worship as well. So again, this morning, the, the offering plates are in the back of the auditorium. And if you haven't already dropped your offering in, you can drop that in that offer, in the offering plate as your way out. Also, if you don't have it with you today or if you're with us online, you can also give through our, our website or our app. Um, you can mail it to the church or bring by here as well. So let's pray now as our act of worship, the gathering of our ties and offerings. Let's pray. <laughs> Most gracious Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we live in a world and that is vast and, and, and it's beautiful and it's a great place that you have placed all of us. And Father, we're so thankful um, for, the, for this world in which we live in. Father, we are thankful for the way you provide for us and you help us and we just wanted the good stewards of the things you've given us. So today, as stewards, we bring back to you a portion of the way you have blessed us. And Father, we ask you now to take that and that you would multiply it and that you would bless it. And Father, we ask for blessings upon those who were able to give this day and who are not. But Father, we ask that these would all be used for the building of your kingdom. Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity and the way you bless us. And um, we give all this to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> 
this time, the kids are dismissed to go to children's church. Today, we are wrapping up our series that we call the Ten Commandments. Um, um, and we've been we're looking at them over, the, over ten weeks. Uh, we've been looking at how the Ten Commandments, they are not just rules that, that are trying to restrict us, but these are, these, these are guidelines. These are uh, ten guidelines that God has given each of us so that we can have an extraordinary life. And today we're going to look at commandment number 10. So if you haven't got your message notes out, pull those out of your bulletin here this morning. And you will grab those and something to write with. And if you can take a few notes as we go along, let's take a look at these. I want us to read out loud number 10. We've gotten to the last one. And in your bulletin, I've highlighted it. Let's say that one together. Let's say it. You, you must not covet. covet. And will you circle that word covet? Circle that word covet. You see, you know, whenever you covet, you want what someone else has. What someone else has. You desire in your heart something that does not belong to you. But listen, when you look at this commandment and we compare it, compare it <clears throat> to some of the other commandments that we looked at, like do not murder, do not steal, you must not lie, you must not commit adultery. Whenever we, we, we compare them to that this one doesn't seem all that important, right? It doesn't look that like it's not that big a deal. I mean, doesn't it seem like uh, it's not that big of a deal? Uh, but we are, we're going to see that this commandment on not coveting is the commandment that if we don't obey, it's very likely we're going to break the other nine commandments if we don't keep this one. See, we have to be very careful with this one, especially since... In many ways, coveting has become the official sin of the 21st century. Almost every postmodern social media culture, this is a big sin. I mean, this is our sin. I mean, think about it. On social media, we're, we're constantly bar, bombarded with these things, these, what these people, they have this perfect life. Uh, that everything is going perfect for them. They have all this stuff. How great their family is. What exotic vacations they're taking around the world. It's enough to make you hate them, right? And we covet what they have. In a recent study, Psychology Today, um, a Psychology Today study examined exactly how social media, instead of making us happy, is actually... No, which what, it, what his intention was is to make us happy, but it's really it's making us miserable. Social media, they say, causes us to become dissatisfied with our own lives, and it strokes within us a desire to have the things that belong to other people. In other words, it causes us to covet it. You see, and here's the truth. This is so us. This is. This is exactly what what we do in our lives, right? We're going along in life, and we're pretty happy. We're perfectly content. And then we look across, and we see that someone has something that we don't have. And then we want what they have. And we have to have it. And all of a sudden, we're miserable. It's because we started to cut it. And we started uh, throwing stuff um, like that, uh, like what we want, right? We want that stuff. We're happy with our house until we look at someone's house is so much better than the house that we have. And and we now we said, you know, when, when you start talking about your house, we said, my house is a piece of junk. You know, look at that house. Look what they got. You thought you were pretty happily married until you see another couple and they're so affectionate with one another. They, you're really getting the thing that your marriage may not be so great. And you're wondering, even if, if you married the right person, right? And you start thinking, and maybe you're happy with your life until you compare yourself to the friend who has a better career or has more money, who is dating someone that you wanted to be dating someone just like that. And now you feel like you're a failure and, re and you resent everything about that other person because you want what they have. See, you are happy. 
until you until you saw what someone else had. And now you want what they have. And now you're miserable. You see how insidious coveting can be? See, it can take someone who is happy and rob them of their happiness without ever changing any of their circumstances around them. The same circumstances where they were happy are the same circumstances they have now where they're miserable. And think about it. That's what coveting does to us. It takes someone who's happy and robs them of their happiness without changing anything else about them. What makes this commandment, I think, so hard to get a handle on is unlike don't steal or don't lie or don't murder, those things are so visible to everyone around us. It's an inward desire that works with, with, uh, from the inside out, and it robs us of the joy that's inside of us and the contentment we have that's inside of us. And we, we do that without really realizing that it's really happening. Look, here's, here, here's the truth. Coveting is something that we all struggle with. See, in your notes, I made this commandment, of this 10th commandment in its entirety, our memory verse for this week. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Uh, and, and I'm just going to read it out to you. Listen, this is the entire verse, the, the entire commandment. It says, you must not co covet your neighbor's house. You must not cover your neighbor's, covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now, I want you to underline that phrase. Anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Because it's not just a few things. It's anything that you want that someone else has. That's why this 10th commandment is such a big deal to God. Well, it's because God loves you. And God wants, you, wants the absolute best for you in your life. But listen, you cannot experience God's best for your life and covet something that someone else has at the same time. It's impossible. You cannot experience God's best life and covet at the same time. In fact, if you flip over the inside of your notes, there's some significant consequences that, will, that happen to us when we break the Tenth Commandment. And I want us to look at these. Some of the consequences that come about when we, when we break this commandment. Uh, some of the consequences. Here's the first one. I am dissatisfied with what I have, and I am angry with God and others. I'm dissatisfied. See, I want you to circle that word, dissatisfied. Circle that word. You know, when you covet, what happens is you lose sight of how really blessed that you really and truly are. You become dissatisfied with what you already have. You even begin to think, well, my life is junk compared to that other person. And you get dissatisfied. And when you're dissatisfied, you start blaming God. Why doesn't God give me those things? Why do they get them and I don't? Well, God, did, did, did they make so much money? Why did, why did they have that boyfriend? Why did they have so much money? Why did they have this great career? I wish I had a great career like that. You know, and you say things like, it's not fair that they have it and I don't. You get mad at God and just... Uh, uh, just like a monkey in an experiment that goes wrong. Remember, you've got plenty, but you're mad at God because you don't have what that other person does have, which leads you, leads you to begrudge that other person. See, you know, you can't be happy for their success because you're upset that they have more than you have, so you tear them down in your mind. You belittle them, you begrudge them, you blame them. It's the ugly outcome when you disobey the Tenth Commandment. First one is, I become dissatisfied. I get angry with God and others. And here's the second one. And, I, and I'm, I'm more likely, the second consequence of disobeying the Tenth Commandment, I am more likely to go into debt and fall into bigger sins. Now listen, this is big. This is big. You see, something that someone else has and you covet it, you want it. And so you go out and you try to find a way so that you can have that thing for yourself. And you know, the new, you know, you may look over there and they have the new iPhone 14 Pro Max. And you, you're stuck over here with the little iPhone 11. 
which is still working perfectly fine, right? But you got to go out, and I've got to have that new iPhone, right? And you know, there, there's the new bag, you know, then maybe a coast bag or whatever. You want that bag, and the new one's just come out, so you want to go out and get it. And let me tell you, the people that you're trying to keep up with, the people that you're trying to emulate, they're probably broke. They're in debt. They're unhappy. That's what happens when you begin to cover what others have and you start trying to do and get the things that they have. It's just going to make you miserable. You know what the number one cause of credit card debt in the country is? Is wanting what someone else has, though you don't have the money to pay for what they have. See, we, we covered that, and it seems harmless on the surface. It seems harmless. And when you allow that sin to stick around, it almost always leads to foolish decisions. And even in some circumstances, it's breaking the other nine commandments. Because if you think about it, the desire to have what's not yours, that's the root of almost every sin that we commit in our life. For example, think about, the, think about the Bible again. Back in Genesis chapter 4, we have Cain and Abel. His brother's relationship with God. That's what, that's what he was coveting, right? He was jealous of it. He wanted his brother's relationship with God, so he broke the commandment number 6, and he murdered his brother. He broke the commandment number 9, and he lied about it, and he tried to cover it up. But then it continues. We go later in Genesis... We remember this guy named Joseph. Joseph's brothers coveted his relationship that he had with his father. To, and so, so because of that, they hated it and they broke commandment number five. They didn't honor their father and mother. They lied to their father. They committed the, they commit, um, they broke that commandment. They broke commandment number six. With, and the, you shall not murder because in their mind they wanted to murder him. Only one of the brothers convinced them not to. See, they broke commandment number eight. They stole his, jet, his multicolored coat. They broke commandment number nine. They lied about it. And they just broke all the commandments here. They, what was one commandment? Just they go on and on. Think about it. We'll get to David. Later on in the New Testament, he covered his neighbor's wife. What did it lead him to do? Well, he broke commandment number six. He murdered his neighbors, his neighbors, so they he could have his wife. He broke commandment number seven. He committed adultery. He broke commandment number eight. He stole the guy's wife. He broke commandment number nine. He lied about it so he could cover it up. I mean, he just ran a straight flush right through the, the, the Ten Commandments, right? You see what I'm talking about? One sin leads to another. And almost every sin in the Bible, almost every sin that we commit is connected in some way to breaking this commandment of coveting, to want something that we don't have, this wanting sometimes doesn't belong to you. Wanting something that does not belong to you. And I want you to see that learning to keep the Tenth Commandment, to not covet, is one of the best safeguards that we can have in order to keep the other nine commandments. Now, the third serious consequence, consequence I think, of disobeying this Tenth Commandment is this. Allow what I covet to become an idol. Write that in. I allow what I covet to become an idol. You know, it's no accident that coveting is this last commandment. Notice the connection between the first two commandments and this tenth. In fact, if you look in the front of your notes, you can be reminded of the first two commandments. The first one is that you must have no other gods before me. And number two is you must not take for yourself an idol of any kind. In other words, don't let anything else in your life replace God. God has to be number one in first place. In other words, don't let anything supersede God in your life. You see, coveting is a form of idolatry. It makes a God a, with a little g, lowercase g, it makes God of your desires. Because you you desire, what you desire becomes an idol in your life. And you pursue that idol over your relationship with God. The sad part is that you expect what you covet, you expect that what, what's going to, that that's going to meet a need in your life that only a relationship with God can really meet. And eventually, you, if you continue going down that path, you are going to land up being not very happy at all, because it never does. 
because here's the thing about idols. They rust, they break, and they always disappoint. I remember youth ministry, um, kids would always come. You know, you're around kids all the time. And one of the things they always said, Mom and Dad, if you buy me this newest game system, I'll never ask for one again. This will be the only one I ever need. I know it's expensive, but I'll never want another. But guess what? Play that for a little bit of time. I want the newer one. And the newer one. And the newer one. It never stops. You see, God begins and ends the Ten, ten Commandments by saying this. Don't put anything above me. And don't settle for anything less than what I have planned for your life. So what does God have for you? What are the benefits of obeying the Tenth Commandment? Well, let's look back on the notes. Look, we looked at the consequences. Here are the benefits. Here's the first one. I'm able to enjoy God's blessing in my life. I want you to circle that word, enjoy. You see, when you cut it, when you set the desires of your heart on something that isn't yours, you rob yourself of the ability to enjoy what God has already blessed you with. It no longer seems like it is enough. When you're able to take your focus off of what others have and instead you recognize what God has blessed you with, that's when you can really be thankful. When you see the things that God has given you, and that's when you can, you, you can, have, you can find contentment and you can find happiness in your life. And here's my encouragement to you. Stop taking inventory of what others have and take personal inventory on what God has given you. That's the first benefit. Here's the second one. I can be genuinely happy when others are blessed. See, this is a big one. And this is a hard one, right? Especially if you have this problem of coveting. I can be happy when others are blessed because one of the curses of coveting is it makes you incapable of being happy when, for someone when they are blessed by God in a way that you have not been blessed. And that's what coveting does. I can't be happy for you because I want what you have and it doesn't work that way. See, I can't be happy when you get the promotion because I wanted that promotion. I can't be happy with you when you get engaged because I want to be married. I can't be happy for you when you're blessed because I'm the one who should really be being blessed by God, right? You see, coveting turns you into a small person. And when you're able to keep this commandment, not only will you be able to enjoy what God has blessed you with, you will be able to rejoice when God blesses other people with what they have. See, you can genuinely be excited for them without being jealous. And I think you agree that is a better way to live, isn't it? All right, we looked at the third benefit of looking at the Ten Commandments. We'll write this in. I trust God more and fight with others less. I trust God more, and I fight with others less. See, when I don't cut it, I trust God more, and I fight with others less. Write that in. Don't flip over your notes. Just yet. Just listen to this. Now remember, when I cut it, what I'm doing is I am harboring this desire to possess something that really belongs to someone else, and it creates inside of me resentment. It creates a competition. It creates animosity. It creates this underlying tension between me and the other person. Now, here, here's what I want you to think about. If you've got issues right now with another person, maybe you've got issues with a person at work or a person at school, or maybe it's a family member or a friend, I want you to do a, a little bit of self-reflection. Is it possible that the source of the tension you have right now is because you're coveting something that they have. Is it possible that they could be causing part of the conflict? Because, you see, when you don't cut it, it's much easier to live in peace with others when you're dealing, when you're willing to deal with this sin, you, you, when you're willing to obey this commandment, it's easier to be, uh, easier for you to be, to be happy for someone else because listen, having what they have no longer becomes the key to your happiness. Now listen, so that's when you're able to trust God more. 
You're willing to allow God to meet your needs. You're able to trust God to make your life meaningful, to make your life fulfilling. You're not trusting in something else. You don't need some item, some physical item to make you happy. You're depending on God. Look, I hope that I've been able to convince you that this sin, it's, it's in your own best interest not to cut it. Not to cut it. And you will actually be happier and more fulfilled person if we do keep this commandment. But how do we do that? How do we live out the tenth commandment? Well, I want to look. I want you to look across your, your your the page into your notes, and I want you. I want us to just take a few min minutes and talk about three practical biblical steps that you and I can take to obey the tenth commandment to live it out. Look at these. Here's the first one. The first step to living out the tenth commandment is this. Choose contentment over comparison. Choosing contentment over comparison. If you want to keep the Tenth Commandment, not to cut it, I must choose contentment over comparison. Because you see, you can choose to be content or you can choose to compare yourselves to other people, but you cannot do both at the same time. It's impossible. It is impossible to do both. One of them, if you have... Contentment and comparison, one of them necessitates the absence of the other. You see, contentment is where you learn to be happy in your circumstances. Whatever your circumstances might be, but comparison is where you hold your life up mixed with someone else's life. Or maybe you hold up your life and you hold it next to this idolized dream that you have created in your, created in your mind of what your life should be like. And whether you're happy or not is determined on whether... You come out in it and how you compare it to each other and how you come out in that. By the way, whenever you compare yourself to someone else, there are only two outcomes and both of them are bad. When I compare myself, the outcome is always bad because here's the first possible outcome. I compare myself to you and I come out smarter and richer and better looking, more talented, more successful than you. In other words, in my mind, I'm satisfied that I am better than you. That is the sin of pride, right? And that's not good. Now, let me tell you, there's nothing that God hates more than pride, and he will remove his blessings from your life if you are guilty of the sin of pride. The first outcome of comparing yourselves to others is that you come out better, and that is the sin of pride, and I lose God's blessing in my life. But the second possible outcome which happens most of the time, is that I compare myself to you and I come out, I don't come out smarter or richer or better looking, more successful than you, uh, more successful than me, which of course it leads to becoming more miserable because I fall so much shorter. Uh, and it leads to the sins of envy and jealousy and coveting what you have. And I just want you to see Comparing yourself to another person or to an idolized view, it's a lose-lose situation every single time. Every time you compare yourself to another person, you lose. You feel miserable. Or it turns out you, you, are, you just turn out to be a very miserable person. Social media only makes it worse. Your friends post pictures of how wonderfully happy their families are. Right? They post pictures of their law school admission letter. They, they post pictures of these exotic vacations that they just came back from. It seems reasonable then for us to assume that their life is a whole lot better than my life. Right? It's a whole lot better. They're happier, but the truth is they have their own problems in their life too. You see, we become so blinded by coveting, we convince ourselves that they have a better life. They have a better job. They have a better family. They have a better income. And our life will be so much better if I had what they had. But I want you to trust me here. You don't want their life. You don't. You have, they have problems too. They just don't post the pics of all the bad things that goes on in their life. They, they had a vicious fight the night before. Uh, with, the, with a husband and their wife, and they had this terrible fight. Then the guy said, "All right, last night it was bad around here. Yes, we had this we, we had this horrible fight." Most people don't post that stuff. 
They only post the good things that are going on in life. They don't post the social media, the fact that their marriage is in shambles and they don't know how much longer it will last. They don't post on the social media that they are drowning in debt. Only they post the things of the things they have. Instead of comparing, choose the contentment that Paul tells his protege, Timothy, to pursue. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6-9, he says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Understand those two, underline those two words, great wealth. Paul says here that if you are content, you're already well off. You are already wealthy. He says, if you're content, you're wealthy. You know the old saying that uh, says, contentment makes a poor man rich. Comparison makes a rich man poor. And that's what he's saying here. He's, he's like, if you're content, he's saying, you are already rich. And then he continues in verse 7. He says, after all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have, what's the next word? Enough. enough. Circle that word, enough. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. So if you have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Now go back to that word enough. That word enough is the cure for cutting. It's the cure for comparison. It's the key to being content. Let me ask you, how much is enough for you? Have you ever thought about it? How much is enough money? How much is enough house? How much is enough technology, enough awards, enough sex, enough food, enough pleasure? How much is enough? You see, the person we have, we, we have such a hard time keeping this Ten Commandment because most people, including us, we can never get enough. Remember John D. Rockefeller, who was one of the first American billionaires, and at the time of his life, he was the richest man in the entire world. And he once was asked, John, how much money is enough? His response, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You know... It's the just a little bit more that always gets us into trouble. It always keeps us from enjoying life. It's a little bit more that causes us to throw off our contentment and want a different spouse, want a different job, to want a different address, to want a different body type, to want a different life. And let me let you in on a secret to a happy life. It's right here in the 10th commandment. It's right here. And in Paul's letter to Timothy, it's when we learn to say, that's enough. I have enough to be happy. See, if we we'll learn to love God and live happily, whether we have a little or whether we have a lot, you can experience real contentment. The extraordinary life that God wants you to have. And the first step to living out the Tenth Commandment is choose contentment over comparison. The second step, think about this. Uh, thank God for what I already have. Thank God for what I already have. Now, just like I said, it's impossible to be content and compare at the same time. It's also impossible to be discontent and thankful at the same time. See, you can't thank God for everything you have and, and that you have now at the same time um, cursing Him for the things that He does not give you. Those don't go together. Let me share you a, a tip on how to be thankful. Think about where you would be without God. Instead of looking now at what you currently are without, Remind yourself of where you would be if you did not have Jesus. If you're living this life without Jesus. Ultimately, we'd be separated from God's love. We would experience eternal damnation. But think about what God has done for you. What has God done for you? Think about it. What Jesus did for you on the cross. His death. 
His burial, His resurrection. He allowed you the opportunity to know the Creator, to have a home in heaven, to have this fulfilling life that He's given you. You see, when you covet, not only do you forget what God has done for you, but it also comes, you causes you to miss what God is currently doing for you in your life. Because let me tell you, if you're so busy looking at what another person has in their life, you're too busy to see what God is doing right now in your life. So instead of focusing on what other people have, learn to see the beauty of God, what God has already blessed you with. Start with eternal life in Jesus. Learn to be grateful for what God has done. And by faith, by faith, believe that He is going to provide you with every single thing that you need. Thank God for the people, for the friends that you have in your life. Thank Him for all the blessings that He has given you in your life. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Be thankful in all circumstances. He doesn't say, in some circumstances... He says, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. How can I make this very practical? How can I learn to be thankful in every circumstances? Well, here's one thing I want us to do this week. When you get home later today, why don't you take out a sheet of paper and start listing on that paper. Why don't you write down everything that you can think of to be thankful for, everything that you have in your life that you can be thankful. I want you to write down the big things and the little things. It doesn't matter. Write down every single thing that you could possibly think, be thank, uh, think of that you are thankful for. And I think that what you're going to find out when you start listing all those things on a the, on the sheet of paper, you're going to realize that you are really, truly blessed by God. Psalm 107 verse 1. Will you read that out loud with me? We'll put it up on the screen. It's in, your, it's in your notes as well. Let's read that together. Psalm 107, verse 1. This is what it says. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Thankfulness. That's the secret to contentment. Now, flip over your notes on the back. How do I live out the Tenth Commandment? I, want, I choose contentment over comparison. I thank God for what I already have. And then number three, I trust that God will meet all of my needs. I will trust that God will meet all my needs. Because listen, underneath everything, the primary reason that we covet what someone else has is because we think if we have those things, have things that that person has, all the needs in our life will be met. And if we have those things, then we would really, truly be happy. See, that if we had that thing that someone else has, that is going to make us feel secure. You know what? If I had, you might be thinking, you know what, if I, if I had, if I had all the money that they had, if I just had that person's life, if I just had their job, if I just had their career, then all my needs in my life would be met. But what we're really saying, what we really are saying is that that thing that they have is what I really want to put my faith in. That thing that they have is what I really want to put all of my hope in. If, if I had that job, if I had that career, if I had that, that would meet all my needs. And then if I just had that, I could put all my faith in that. And that is going to be my God, my, my little G God, right? Listen, if you go back all the way to the beginning of this series, all the way back to that very first commandment, I want you to look at what God says. It's there in your, in your notes, the commandments. Number one, it's in Exodus 20 verse 3. It says, you must have no other God but me. How do you know what your gods are? Simply put, where do you turn when you want to? when you have something, some need that needs to be met. Who or what do you turn to uh, with, to meet your, your needs? Because, listen, if you put your trust, put your trust in money to meet your biggest needs, the money has become your little G God. If you put your trust in another person to meet your needs, that person has become your God in your life. 
Let me ask you, what happens when the money runs out? What happens when we have relationship struggles? What happens when you finally get all of the success that you really have been wanting, but you still feel empty on the inside? So that's when we discover that all these little G's that we have in our life, all these things that we put our trust in, that none of them is the one true God of the universe. The one who really and truly can meet all of our needs physically and emotionally and spiritually. In Psalm 34 verse 10, David writes these words. He says, Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. He says, even the king of the jungle can meet all of their own needs. Then he continues, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Have you come to the point in your life where you realize that you realize that going your own way is just not working? I want you to see that what the Ten Commandments are all about. Look, the Ten Commandments, they aren't God's way of keeping you in line. They aren't a list of rules that are designed to restrict you. They are these guidelines to show you how you can live your life and that your life can be this extraordinary life. God loves you. And, the, and only a loving God could take the time to say, I care about you so much. I want to show you how to live life. Because I love you so much. How life can really be lived so that you can, spirit, can experience life and experience all the things that you were created for. You know, the truth is none of us, neither you or I can perfectly live out the Ten Commandments. We can't. We cannot keep even one of the Ten Commandments for that matter. We all fall short. If you're like me, during this series, uh, in some ways, it's been a little discouraging because you're thinking, I broke that one, I broke that one, I broke that one, I've broken all of these because I feel that way as well as I'm looking at it. But the good news is, the Ten Commandment reminds us how much we need Jesus. We need Jesus. They remind us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus went to, to the cross so that we could be forgiven even when we can't keep the commandments. So that we can be made right with God. So that we can have eternal life in heaven and live this extraordinary life that God wants us to live. I want us to end the Ten Commandments right now by reading aloud the same verse as we read the Ten Commandments in week one when we began this series. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 27. I want us to read that out loud. Would you read it with me? It says this. You will be blessed if you will obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. Would you bow your heads with me here today? Would you bow your heads with me right now? Let's just pray. Bow your head. Let this be a time between you and God. That you can connect with God. That you can talk with God. Talk to Him right now. Say, Father, we have come before you today. And we confess we confess to you right now that we put our trust in other things and other people and things that do not belong to us and we do covet. We're a covetous people. God, it makes us miserable and it turns us into miserable people. We don't want that anymore. Father, we ask you here today as a congregation, as your people, help us to put our trust in you. You are the one who can meet our needs. You are the one who can make us happy, God. Help us to put our trust in you. Help us to stop comparing ourselves to others in, in order to find value. Help us to be content with what we have. And God, may we be thankful and see all the ways that you are blessing our lives. Father, I want to pray for those who are here today. Maybe they've been living their lives apart from you and they've been going their own way. God, maybe today, for the first time, they need to make their life right with you. Father, when you, when we look at the Ten Commandments you've given us, they remind us that we fall short. 
that uh, that we need. We need you. That we cannot do this on our own. And we are so thankful today that you love us so much that you sent Jesus, that he died on the cross for us so he could take our sins away from us. And on the cross, he took what we deserved. We were the ones who had turned their back on you. So Father, today, we as a congregation and as individuals here, we thank you for Jesus. I just pray if there's someone here today that needs you, that they need to turn to you, they need to accept you as their Lord and their Savior, that they will do that today before we leave this building. Father, uh, we just pray that, uh, that uh, as we leave here today, thank you for the Ten Commandments. Thank you that they show us the best life. God, thank you that they also remind us of how much we need Jesus. We love you. We probably sing in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of decision. We're going to sing a song. You know, it's a, an appropriate song, right? Better is one day. And that song is it, what it says. It comes straight out of Scripture. Better is one day in your course in a thousand places. Anywhere else. That we want to be with Jesus. We want to be with God. And this morning, you have a decision to make. Maybe it's decision you make right where you're standing. Maybe something you made public can come forward. Maybe you need to accept Jesus your word and say, we can help you do that here today as well. But will you stand with me? Will you sing with me? And if you have a decision make, make it as we sing.
this evening. We have services here at 6 o'clock. Uh, come and join us. Uh, class for all ages begin on Wednesday night. And everyone have a great 4th of July. Uh, so let's close our prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your son Jesus. And it's great to be able to gather with your people and worship together here today. And Father, as we leave this place, we just pray and that you would give us opportunities to be able to share with others what you've done in our own lives. And Father, help us share that in such a way that they want to have a relationship with you as well. And so Father, we pray for those opportunities and we pray that you would give us the courage to take up those opportunities as they present themselves. So Father, as we leave here, grace you be with us so we meet again. We pray these things in Jesus' name.